Okay, so welcome. This is on the beginning of a new series of projected events by the Saltire Society. And it's in, been supported by the widow of one of our most distinguished former members, Paul Henderson Scott, uh, and the other, so that in relation to that, there are a number of books at the stall at the back with Joy Henry, the Chapman stall, which are available for you freely to take away uh, uh, as you leave. So please feel free to do that. Um, the purpose of tonight's uh, project and discussion is to mark the, the beginning of the run-up to the 90th anniversary in three years' time of the Saltire Society, and a process by which we are thinking again as a society with our membership about what it's for, who we are, who we are as a country, who we are as a culture. The Saltire Society has begun, as, you rem as not many one in this room will remember, but began in 1936 at a time when Scottish culture was under real pressure, real negative pressure. And those folk, Eric Linklater and others who helped found it, actually wanted to make sure that in that interwar period, there was not a kind of loss of the long-term culture of our country. Uh, and what has inspired tonight's event is a sense that we're not quite there. And let's be honest, the, the pressure that the Salter Society brought did change an atmosphere. So it's since then, we've had Scottish Opera, Scottish National Theatre, we've had the development of the rep movement using new Scottish plays. All of that comes as part of a rethinking of what Scotland is, was, and could be. And what we do now think, given the pressures that we're all under, let's not even mention cost of living. Look, I just mentioned it. We have to think again, what is the way forward for our culture? So it's a very great honour and, and pleasure to welcome Joyce McMillan and David Gregg to lead off this debate. The format will be that they will each talk for about a quarter of an hour, they will then exchange views because they won't necessarily have heard each what the other says for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open up to question and answer and uh, discussion. Uh, at that point, I should alert you that this whole event is being recorded and if you object to being filmed and recorded, I'm terribly sorry, but, but this is what we have to do. Um, and uh, you may wish to withdraw at some point when the recording starts, although we hope you'll stay. At this point, also, one says things like, one doesn't need to introduce the speakers. But let me say two or three things about each of them. Joyce McMillan is surely one of the most influential and insightful cultural commentators of our time. A very fine theatre critic. She's had honorary degrees, which are well deserved. She has been influential in thinking about the way that theatre operates in our society and continues to think not just about theatre, but about culture. And it's important to underline that while the focus tonight, inevitably because of the people involved, will be focused on theatre, we are thinking in a broader term about culture and our culture includes the sciences, includes public life, includes housing architecture, as well as the arts. The other speaker, David Gregg, again known to many of you through his work, one of the most uh, widely translated living British playwrights, uh, an outstanding playwright of whom many of us are deeply admir full of admiration and also a little bit of jealousy because of his fantastic ability to produce plays of enormous originality after one after another after another. So it's my great delight and pleasure to welcome them to speak tonight and to invite, invite Joyce to start us off. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I think this is one of these microphones that is best if you put it right in front of your, your mouth, so to speak. So that, can everyone hear me clearly? Is that working? Yes, good. Um, excellent. Thank you so much um, for that we welcome, Ian. And it really is um, a privilege and an honor um, to be here uh, opening up this 
slightly unusually formatted Fletcher of Saltoon lecture for 2023. Theatre, you know, is a collaborative art form and both David Gregg and I uh, obviously work around theatre. Uh, he makes it, I review it. And so I, I hope that in the spirit of that art form, we'll have a good collaborative um, lecture and discussion tonight about the future of Scotland's culture. When I was thinking about this topic, I began to think about the changes I've seen in Scotland's culture in the 40 years since I began to write about it, more than 40 years now. I like to say 40 years, but it's knocking on for 45 um, years since I first began to write about uh, Scotland's culture. And I can't help feeling that I was extremely fortunate as a young journalist to begin writing at the beginning of the 1980s which I think with hindsight was an exceptional decade for Scotland's culture. I mean, everyone thinks that the decade when they were young was exceptional. Um, the 70s had also been a remarkable decade in many ways with the TV at the Stag and the Black Black Oil at the beginning and um, the Giles Havergal um, um, triumvirate at the Citizens doing their fantastic work. And that's only to refer to theater, never mind poetry. Um, novels, uh, visual arts, which were also in a tremendously exciting place during the 70s and 80s. But all the same, there was something about coming to this profession of theatre criticism and arts writing um, round about 1979, which marked the beginning, obviously, of the Thatcher government at UK level, um, which really meant that I kind of caught a wave of energy um, in Scotland that was unusual. I think levels of funding um, in real terms, um, historically at the end of the 70s, although people always complained about funding, were probably historically quite high. We had big, vigorous local authorities at two levels, um, which um, made uh, many uh, terrific arts initiatives. Uh, we, one of the biggest ones um, um, for me as a young theatre critic was Mayfest, which was launched at the beginning of the 1980s, 1982, I think, um, by Glasgow City Council, by the ST. UC with a lot of support from um, Strathclyde Regional Council. Um, and it was a, an exciting moment um, for Scotland in the sense that there was a huge consensus in the country that really the direction of Thatcherism was not a direction in which our country wanted to go. We had no devolved parliament at that time, obviously. We were governed by Scottish office ministers from a party that um, only a small minority in, in Scotland had supported. And that kind of created the arena for a kind of, not so much a rebellion against Thatcherism, but some really creative thinking about what kind of country, if not that, then what? If Scotland didn't want to be that kind of country that the UK seemed to be becoming, then what kind of country did we want to become? And so many interesting answers in terms of language, in terms of ethos, in terms of moral values and thinking, in terms of internationalism, particularly, which was particularly strong, I think, in that decade and in the run-up to Glasgow's year as, as European City of Culture in 1990. It was a really good time to be a young critic writing about the arts in Scotland. And I think looking back that we're still living with the positive legacy of that time in so many ways. Many of the artists who were involved in it um, are still with us, um, although many of them are elderly now. Um, I've just seen uh, the new show about um, uh, Billy Connolly, Dear Billy, um, which it was playing at the Traverse last week and is now on tour all across Scotland, which is a love letter from the people of Scotland um, to Billy Connolly based on um, verbatim sort of conversations with people about him. And that reminded me of the tremendous impact that Billy Connolly had around that time as, as a, a new kind of Scottish voice, pretty cheeky, pretty rude, um, pretty outward looking, pretty energetic, not frightened of anyone, and certainly not afraid of speaking in a strong um, Scottish voice. And um, hardly anyone really failed to find Billy Connolly um, funny and in some way um, life enhancing and he of course was part of that great group which had begun in the early 1970s around the great Northern Welly Boot show and all that but there was a huge constellation of talent who were just kind of coming into their 30s and 40s at that time and some of them 
um, are still with us and still working. And the legacy of that time in terms of theatre, in terms of literature, in terms of music, in terms of visual arts, and beyond that, I think, um, um, even into our politics, um, has been tremendous. Um, round about the middle of the 1990s, I think that wave of cultural innovation kind of uh, came to an end of that phase. Um, and what it left behind as the initiative passed to politics and to the setting up of the new parliament and so on, was a very strong set of liberal and outward looking presumptions about what kind of country we wanted this new devolved Scotland to be. And I think you can still see the traces of it in the very liberal attitude to citizenship and um, the sort of inclusive attitude to all kinds of issues, which the Scottish Government, um, to my mind rightly, continues to take to this day. So we're still living with the legacy of that wonderful time and with the huge generation of creative um, energy that it produced. And if you look at literature alone, for instance, you know, the whole phenomenon of tartan noir, the massive generation of Scottish writers that are involved in that, the different ways in which they handle that genre, and so on. All of that kind of began round about back then, although some would say that, that Willie McIlvanny was at it even before that. And, and, and all of that kind of energy, all of the um, events that have um, emanated from that. So when I look at the sort of points of um, energy and excitement in the Scottish arts scene now, you know, the places where people really find joy and where they find um, energy and affirmation. There are so many, I can't even begin um, to talk about it. I mean, there's a, a production of Anna Karenina on in David's Theatre, the role I see him at this moment, which is cheeky and mouthy and don't go if you're any kind of Tolstoy purist, but it is an absolute joy for the energy of young Scottish female uh, writers and performers that you can see in that version of this famous story, which of course has fantastic female characters, and it's absolutely right to put them at the centre um, of the drama. So there are so many points of joy that I don't know where to start. But if I look at some of the ones that are most widely recognised as being remarkable, and they continue to be remarkable now, despite all of the difficulties um, of the last period with the pandemic and the huge pressures on funding now, I'm thinking of things like Celtic Connections, the fantastic festival that was founded in Glasgow in 1994 and has become a kind of global beacon, not only for music but for all of the other events um, that surround that. I'm thinking of things like the play pie and pint phenomenon at Oran Moor in Glasgow, which produces 35 new plays, mainly by Scottish writers, every single year. They're short plays, they're produced on a shoestring, but nonetheless, the presence of that initiative um, has been an absolutely transformational thing for people trying to get plays on in Scotland, you know, at a sort of, at a sort of economic level, where where you can try and fail and hopefully um, try again. And who was responsible for that? David McLennan, who himself came from that great 784 um, generation, but his spirit absolutely lives on in every director and every artist who has worked on those play pie pint um, seasons since David's very sad death in 2014. There are book festivals now absolutely everywhere. I remember Wigtown as a miserable wee place where me and my family had one of the worst caravan holidays of our lives in the early 1960s. Now, look at it. Scotland's book town, absolutely thriving. And that's just one of a dozen, I don't know, 24, 30 um, really, um, really successful book festivals all over, um, all over Scotland. If you're interested in, the, in, in uh, Scottish language and culture, then I think there's a new generation of tremendously exciting writers particularly poets and, and sort of, a, I don't know, kind of spoken word artists who are also interested in uh, new kinds, new variants of Scots, of Gaelic, and even of Orkney dialect, which uh, recently had its Orkney dialect, I probably shouldn't call it that, Orkney language, which recently had its very first science fiction novel um, published by a, a young um, Scottish writer. There are phenomena like um, the Edinburgh International Children's Festival, which begins next week. Um, um, you know, and is now one of the leading uh, children's festivals in the world. About 40 years old, just over 40 years old, started in a load of tents in Inverleith Park, but is now one of the world's leading festivals of children's um, theatre and always well worth looking at, and so on and so forth. I really could 
go on all night. And, and these are only the art forms that I know most about. You know, there are others, there are areas like film and all the rest of it, where there are so many beacons and landmarks that people would want um, to draw attention to. And of course, um, <clears throat> one of the most um, exciting appointments, I think, in recent years in the Scottish arts, um, that this year we welcomed um, the first ever woman and the first ever person born in Scotland to take up the role of director of the Edinburgh International Festival in Nicola Benedetti, and an absolutely inspirational young leader in the world of classical music and culture more generally, um, and that appointment surely represents some kind of landmark. So these are all tremendously good things, and a lot of them, like the Nicola Benedetti um, appointment, have to do with including people previously excluded um, in many ways, Scotland has become a leader in some areas of including people in the field of the arts who were previously excluded. Um, there's the wonderful theatre company based here in Edinburgh called Long Ha that works with adults with learning difficulties. And anyone who saw their recent show at the Lyceum, again, thank you, David, um, and the wonderful Castle Lennox, which was about the notorious Lennox Castle, one of Scotland's most feared um, mental institutions or institutions of incarceration for people who didn't quite fit. Um, that was a tremendous show created by that company using the life experience of the people who are members of that company to give it additional depth and, 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 and feeling. Um, uh, Scotland is also um, fairly well recognised for its um, inclusion of people with physical disabilities, other disabilities, um, in, um, in the creative life, certainly of theatre. There's a whole generation now of artists with dis disabilities of one kind or another who are really making a huge impression on the Scottish um, creative scene as far as theatre is concerned. Women have gone from being quite a small minority in the world of theatre to, according to the latest statistics from the wonderful Christine Hamilton, who some of you might remember from her days as deputy director director at the Scottish Arts Council in the 1990s, um, says that between uh, 2015 and 2020, the proportion of women taking up major artistic roles, that's any kind of role, I mean temporary freelance roles, um, um, as well as permanent jobs, but the, the proportion of women doing those jobs in Scottish theatre rose in those five years from 39% to 48%, and in some areas the women were in a majority, like a majority of professional productions um, presented that year in Scottish theatre were directed by women, which absolutely would not have been the case even 10 years earlier. And again, thank you, David, who has, has made a huge policy during his time as artistic director of the Lyceum of foregrounding women in the arts. And these are not just tick boxes. I wouldn't be standing here because I'm not really much of a one for tick boxes. I mean, I love to see um, minority groups and previously excluded groups doing well, but what I love to see above all is great theatre. And and I think the voices of these previously excluded groups um, are now making themselves heard in ways that are brilliant, that really change and, and, and lift our perceptions of the world that we're living in. Um, and that also goes for the new generation of young Scottish artists of colour, particularly young black women who have grown up here in Scotland with Scottish voices and Scottish experience, but also with the experience of being black in Britain today. Um, they made a fantastic show, uh, The Lament for Sheku Bayo, about the case of uh, Sheku Bayo, the man who was killed in, um, in, in, in being arrested by um, police in, in Kirkcaldy. Um, some years ago, um, and that all-female show about that tragedy was entirely driven by young Scottish women artists of colour, the writer, the musician, all of the cast, um, the singers, the actors, everyone involved. Um, and so the energy of that is not just a tick box exercise. Some of these shows are life transforming when you see them. And all of these things seem to me to be great achievements of Scottish culture in recent years. Do we face some issues? Yes, um, we absolutely do. Um, the pressures on funding are severe and 
unnecessary, given the small amounts of money involved. I mean, basically, as, as Lynn Gardner was arguing in the stage only today about the whole of England, um, the sums involved in arts funding just aren't big enough for it to be worth being penny-pinching about them. The Scottish Government could double the budget for the creative arts tomorrow and never really miss the money. Compared with the money that it has to spend on the NHS and so on, this is a drop in the ocean. It's a small, um, it's a small sector of the economy. It's one where pay is not high and where people don't seek high pay because they've got more interesting things on their minds. Um, but it is one that delivers a colossal bang for the buck, both in terms of enhancing the lives of communities all across Scotland and in terms of enhancing Scotland's image in the world. Um, and I don't know why governments so continuously penny pinch over it. It just seems to me to be pointless and daft, and there's very little argument uh, for it at all. But they do, and they have been doing in recent years. And one depressing aspect of this funding pinch, which I think um, should be regarded as a danger, is the temptation in order to justify spending on culture to kind of target it at groups that are seen as in some way needy. Oh, you know, we'll do something for people with dementia, or we'll do something for people who have been involved in crime, or we'll do something for care experienced young people. All very laudable, and sometimes the work that's done is very good. But I think at the heart and soul of arts funding and the position of the arts and culture in a community should be the knowledge and the acknowledgement that the arts is for everyone or it's nothing. You can't chop it up into little slices and say we'll do it here because it's appropriate here but not there. Everyone has a right um, to, to access to brilliant creative arts and to the chance to exercise and, and, and take part in those arts if they want to. And that goes for absolutely everyone at any age of any income. It's not right to have an attitude to the arts, which is that you only kind of use it when you need it. Because then when you turn to it and try to find it to use it when you need it, you'll find that it's not there. Because that's not really how creativity works. What happens in the arts always has um, to be led um, by artists. One thing that I think is even more problematic, and I, I briefly touched on it when I talked about the atmosphere of the 1980s, is the growing centralisation of Scottish public life. I think even many people who are very supportive of the SNP and the cause of independence would say that one of the most disappointing things about this 16 years of SNP government has the, been the failure to re-empower, to strengthen and to really reform local government. Local government is a basic building block of democracy in any society and we can see that by looking at the very successful social democracies of the Nordic countries, all of which have a far greater density of local government and far greater involvement in local government than we have. And the disempowerment of local government through throughout the UK, but also in Scotland, by um, too much central government funding um, and by too much work which is just about implementing and being a kind of executive arm or administrative arm of what central government wants done, is not helping the texture of Scottish public life. So I would say that reforming local government and restoring it to the place where it was when it could actually take major cultural initiatives on its own account would be an extremely important part um, of a kind of reinvention of arts funding and of attitudes to the arts for the 21st century. It also detaches funding um, for the arts from the contentious matters of national politics, notably in Scotland, the national question, because when people are thinking about what their local communities need, um, then they're not thinking about those questions. They're thinking about the nitty-gritty of life, about which communities need to be represented, about what people need in the way of a bit of fun in their lives, which is certainly should be um, a high priority. Um, at the moment. Um, and by the way, that goes not just for, for the arts, but for many other issues, you know, from marine protection to energy. If you don't have strong, energised local communities with good democratic representation of their voices, then you're missing a whole layer of involvement and implementation that makes your society work. And that's as true in other areas as it is um, in the arts. And then finally, there's just that subtle thing um, of knowing um, that if you want your country to exist, and that was the motive for the setting up of the Saltire in the first place, you know, to make sure that Scottish culture 
and in that sense Scotland continued to exist at a time of high unionism and great pressures of many kinds, then you have to keep making, inventing and creating that country. As I said, I was lucky to, to, to begin my career as an arts writer at a time when many, many very, very gifted artists were interested in and involved in that process and wanted to have you know, some input, not always a very predictable input or indeed a very politically correct input um, to, to thinking about what Scotland would be like, but they were interested in that conversation. I think maybe more so than they are today, I don't know. But anyway, it was a great time to be involved in that conversation. And I think, um, whether, whether these trends go up and down or not, I think there are still plenty of brilliant young artists in Scotland today who remain interested in that kind of conversation. What kind of country is it? And how do we make our Scotland for tomorrow? I'm always looking for the source of a quotation that I am sure I heard once from a great Welsh poet um, who said very memorably, if you want Wales, you must make Wales. And that is as true of Scotland as it is of Wales or any other country of a certain size here in our part of Europe. And our question, I suppose, that we have to address is how much will the next generations want to make Scotland or how much will their minds uh, be elsewhere? Uh, they might have come to take Scotland for granted. You know, we've had a Scottish Parliament for more than 20 years now. We've had an SNP government. They may see that as the establishment, the next generation up, uh, may rebel against the whole idea of Scottishness. They may fancy themselves like John Lennon, so brutally criticised by the National Conservatives, or Nazis, as many people are calling them, um, in London the other week, um, when somebody said that he had destroyed a generation by daring to imagine a world with no countries. But, you know, we may see another generation like that. Or we may simply begin to see all national cultures, and certainly the ones belonging to smaller nations, submerged in a global internet culture which is anglicised, Americanized, all absorbing, totally attention commanding, um, and over which none of us really as individuals and very few governments even have much control at all. So those are the threats we face. But I hope I've, 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 um, I've made the case that we also have pl plenty of resources um, to deal with those threats. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't wish to sound too McDermott-ish when I say that um, I do believe, perhaps not in Scotland's hidden powers, but in the, in the power of our artists and creative people, which is an awful lot of us. Many, many people have creative lives, whether they make a living at it or not. And I do believe in the power of our artists and creative people to keep creating even in the most difficult circumstances and to make new Scotlands every day. Thank you very much. First of all, if I can be heard as well, great. Well, goodness. Um, thank you, Joyce. Um, I, that was incredibly inspiring. Um, so now I'm going to bring the mood down. <laughs> I won't. I'll bring it back up at the end. But I do want to start, like all the best Scottish evenings, I think we should begin with a lament. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I once read that the fishermen of the Gulf of California um, were interviewed at various intervals through time about what, um, what, they, what fish they expected to find in the Gulf of California. And the, grand, the grandfather fisherman, uh, the grandparental generation said that there was about 40 or 50 species of fish that you ought to find in the Gulf of California. And the father generation said there was about five species of fish that you ought to find in the Gulf of California, and the children of the, the, the young fishermen said there was about two species of fish that you should expect to find in the Gulf of California. It's all a way of saying that what we grow up with is what we think is natural, but it's not always natural. And as Joyce has pointed out, I was incredibly lucky 
to be a generation that came in the wake of the generation she described in the 1970s and 80s, um, who forged such an extraordinary uh, uh, response, I suppose, both to um, Thatcherism, but also to the national question, but also to the international questions that were taking place at that time. Um, with the result that what I took when I was beginning to be natural was uh, magazines such as Chapman, Ken Crastus, Gare Fish, Radical Scotland, the Scotsman regularly having thick books pages, the Herald also, the two Sunday papers, I think three Sunday papers at one point, BBC Scotland having a quite sizable television drama as well as a very sizable radio drama output. Um, the uh, ability for an artist to buy a house in Edinburgh. I was uh, reflecting on the Corries having written Flower of Scotland. Somebody was describing the house where they first heard it played, and it was the house of one of the Corries. And I was just reflecting that no Corries of today would be able to afford any accommodation in Edinburgh of that magnitude. Um, the Traverse at that point would have been doing about seven shows a year. There would have been about 10 at the Lyceum. There would have been five touring companies, probably each doing somewhere in the region of three shows a year, and that's without including the project-funded companies. Um, in real terms, the artistic director of the Lyceum at that point had something in the region of two million more pounds than uh, is available to me from the government to spend. I also benefited from free further education. Whilst I was having that free further education, there was housing benefit, unemployment benefit, a, an entire environment in which it was possible for a young person to emerge into the world and throw himself into art um, without serious concern for how you might eat that day. Um, I could go on. I, I think what I want to ask, though, is... So that's what I think is natural. Um, but in actual fact, Scottish culture isn't necessarily a natural phenomenon. It's natural, of course, that there should be culture in Scotland. But as the Saltar Society proved 90 years ago by getting together in order to defend, promote such a thing as Scottish culture, they recognised that it is in fact an act of will that there is such a thing as Scottish culture, as Joyce said, if you want Scotland, you must make it, and it must continually be remade generation by generation. And I worry that we've become complacent and we think it's natural. So, for example, we think it's natural that there is a Lyceum Theatre company that produces theatre. Well, it's not. It, it didn't exist until the 1945 settlement allowed there to be funding for arts companies. In fact, none of them producing houses in Scotland would, would, in quotes, naturally exist. We're not a big enough population for that. They exist because there was a decision made that there should be funding for the arts and that things like repertory theatre, uh, dance theatre, Scottish opera and so on, were a moral good, and a moral good that ought to exist for the benefit of everybody. Um, and what I fear has happened is politicians and perhaps even citizens have come to feel as though things like the Edinburgh Festival, which of course was an invention, it didn't happen because Edinburgh's just so great festivals sprout up. It happened because people decided to do it. And again, everywhere I look, I see a kind of complacency. I see a feeling that we can complain about these things, we can moan about these things. Um, uh, and they'll kind of always exist. It's just, you know, it's just a, a cross we have to bear having an international festival on our doorstep. Um, so, sorry if I sound a bit grumpy, I will get cheerier. But the, 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 against this complacency, I want to, to um, say the naturalness that I, I benefited from all of the people not just the Saltire Society, all the people who said that there shall be such a thing as Scottish culture and we shall support it in the form of magazines and newspapers and radio and all of these things. And so I suppose what I look at now is I see that Scottish culture 90 years ago was faced with a threat from outside, uh, i.e. that it was going to be swallowed up by a, a grander anglicised culture, whereas I would now say I fear that the threat comes from... Um, a kind of stasis 
or complacency. Um, it comes in, in effect from ourselves. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is unionist nationalism. So I think one of the things that was interesting for me if I look at the 20th century is that it was perfectly possible to be a very unionist uh, person, but also to strongly support Scottish culture. Uh, many, many Labour MPs, as well as Conservative MPs, saw absolutely no problem in Scots language, in Doric language, in Gaelic language, but also combining that with a political outlook which saw Scotland as part of the Union. Um, of course, there were always many nationalists also proposing these things, but it, it strongly felt to me when I was growing up that you did not have to make a decision on the national question in order to like Hugh McDermott or in order to uh, like the music of Hamish Henderson or, or so many others. What I'm worried about now is that we've found ourselves in a situation, and I don't know how we've got here, where to like, for example, Scots language is now perceived as a divisive um, sign, either you, it, it puts you on one side or the other of the national question. Same with Gaelic. Um, I see the idea of support for the arts getting tarnished with a brush of, oh, you know, you're just, for example, might be accused of just being SNP. But on the other hand, I have also seen people whose art, uh, for example, tr uh, might take money from British central government or indeed from the so-called Brexit festival. It, not really a very fair title of it, but I've seen people being criticised and saying, oh, you shouldn't take that money, you shouldn't, you're just a mouthpiece for, the, for, for those um, bad actors. Uh, I don't know how we got into a situation where the simple act of writing a novel or making a play was... Um, was instead of being regarded as a bringing together moment of politics, politics in the real sense, getting people in a room to talk, was perceived instead as a kind of demonstration of your allegiance to one side of an or another. Um, on the other hand, I see we've had 15 years of austerity. That's come from the Tory government in the South. Uh, but it has also not fundamentally been able to be defended against by the government here and 15, 15 years of standstill funding has an effect. I, I, I don't know how to I, to, I think it's so boring when people say it's about money, it's about funding. I, 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 I can't be, it's, it just seems so dull and yet I have to tell you that 15 years of standstill funding, this, you cannot make that up with efficiency, you cannot make it up with low wages, you cannot make it up with less productions. I mean, at the Lyceum, nearly every show that we do now is a co-production. Of course, that's wonderful. I really approve of that. But at the same time, we have to recognize that that is because I'm trying to make up lost money uh, that would have otherwise come from central or local government. And I have to say, Joyce's point about local government is extremely salient here. Um, but there's also something else Joyce alluded to, which is a kind of corporatism that I think we've allowed to creep into our um, arts establishments, our arts funding, our political discourse about the arts. Um, it's a kind of Blairite corp corporatism hangover in a way, um, where we, we sort of, you know, art is very good because it is educational, or art is very good because it, you know, can solve one or other particular health issues, or art is very good um, because, you know, perhaps some, I don't know, it makes, makes our trade better in some way, shape or form. All of these things may be true, and in fact, I'll go to the bat and defend um, art in Scotland as, as something that does make the country a great deal of money, but that isn't the point. Art, Scottish culture, art in Scotland is a moral purpose. It is, a, it is, it is not a, it, it, it is not a commercial purpose. That is a happy byproduct of its important purpose, which is to be uh, a means by which we, f we form uh, connections to each other and by which we understand ourselves. Um, and so I suppose when I look back to 90 years ago and what the Saltire Society was founded in order to protect, I, n I now say, well, look, you know, you did manage to protect it from that, but but we're in danger here because the culture that we now have is neither the, the rebel culture of the 1980s, nor is it the long dreamed of early days of a better nation. 
Um, nor is it, in fact, the kind of high imperial culture of um, the Victorian period or, from, or of Walter Scott or so forth. Instead, what we seem to have at the moment is a devolved culture. And I'm not sure we know really what a devolved culture is. Um, you may have noticed in the autumn a number of arts institutions were going down. The film house, a, uh, the, it seemed at one point nearly every day there was a save this organization, save that organization. Um, thankfully, that's eased off a little bit due to various things like we got through the winter. But um, that is the, that's what we're... <laughs> That's the reality underneath all of this, is that we're, we're an ace, every arts company is an ace away from needing to be saved. And saving is a very odd phrase, saving, like as if these are sort of, art is a kind of charity case, you know, save this poor, helpless, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 hapless person on the street, instead of understanding that art is a decision we all make, it's something that we all agree that we need and that we provide. And I fear that, like every other public, that I fear that the art has become just another badly funded public service um, in, in our current uh, uh, culture. And I don't particularly blame that. I, I, mean, you know, I think the deep blame for that does lie with 15 years of austerity. But I also think it begs a question to all of us in this room and to all of our politicians, at what point did we decide it was fine to let all of that go? Uh, because I, I, I don't remember that. Um, but there is a, to come to a ray of pos positivity, uh, well, I, I was first gonna say, with a question with Scottish culture, that when things need to be saved, I think we find ourselves saying, who, who wants there to be Scottish culture? What is it for? Who is willing to pay for it? And what is it ultimately to be? And that's where I think we come to an interesting uh, point. And I, and I want to turn to a more positive thing. Joyce talked about we. There is a, there's a Yeats quote that I like where he said, every sentence about Ireland that starts with the word we is a lie. Um, now, I, I'm not sure I'm quite there, but I do think it's very important that we ask this question of who is we whenever we say we. I often think it often means I, you know, we are troubled by this, could just as easily be I am troubled by this, or you know, we should do more, I should do more. But with that in mind, I think what's interesting is the we of Scottish culture has profoundly changed over 40 years. And as Joyce implies, I think it's changed in a very positive and interesting way. I think that we are very much more aware now of all the different types of Scot, all the different ways to be Scottish, all the different ways to represent that, whether it be anything from opera to um, the most noisy hip-hop music, anything from theatre to very postmodern to most traditional theatre. Um, the voices who are telling the stories come from all different parts of Scotland. We're much more open, I think, on our stages now to, uh, um, in our stages and films, to different languages and so forth. So I do think there is a positive fragmenting, no, there's a positive multiplicity underneath the we of Scottish culture. But, I, but I'm not sure that we've yet understood quite how that can forge itself um, into a force in the way that Joyce described in the 1980s, a, a slightly simpler um, uh, a moment of almost uh, uh, us and them. Uh, the pressure from outside from Thatcherism created a response in Scottish uh, culture. I think we're in a situation where we're slightly all lost. It's a little bit unclear what the direction of travel is. People talk about there being a crisis in Scottish arts, and all I would draw your attention to is the Greek word crisis um, uh, sort of has two meanings. We understand it to be a problem, but in fact it's the moment of change. It's the moment where the patient might either die or recover. Um, and in that sense, I think this is a crisis in Scottish culture. Um, I think I described us as having a devolved 
culture, and I hinted that I thought there was some ways in which that was bad. But there is also the possibility that a devolved culture speaks to something very deep and wonderful in Scottish culture. Um, a duality, a dual identity, sometimes known as the anti-zigi, anti anti-zigi. I could write it, I can't, I can't say it. But, but, but a dual identity that has been at the heart, actually, of Scottishness and Scottish culture from its very beginnings uh, uh, as part of the Union and which continues now. And I wonder if, instead of what feels sometimes like a settled, complacent, devolved moment, we might turn that into um, an opportunity and say, what if Scottish culture was actually the response to Brexit? What if Scottish culture was actually the response to this strange political moment? What if Scottish culture was actually the response um, to our divisions, to our fragmentations, to our multiplicities? Um, I'm, I'm aware that really early on uh, uh, in, in Scottish culture you had a kind of McDermott strand but you also always had a W.S. Graham strand as well. W.S. Graham, the poet who went to Cornwall and, and um, wrote his poetry there, uh, saw himself as part of an extraordinary modernist scene there. For every uh, Norman McKeg, you also have Kenneth White and his School of Geopoetics in France. Um, for every John McGrath working in Scotland and touring the Highlands, you have a Tom McGrath who is going to London and forming the International Times and taking heroin with Allen Ginsberg, and that's, I hope he did, and I'm not, you know, calumny there, I don't, I don't want to, but the point is there's always been a, um, there's always been a strand that both pulls in to Scotland and an outward strand. So I think my call to us as artists, to us as a Saltar society, to us as a political culture is to say, can we use our devolved moment, can we use our anti-Ziggy to both pull in the direction of international and European and actually cross Britain and cross islands of Britain and Ireland and at the same time also um, continue and dig into the same local focus that brings us the incredible traditional work that we do and the incredible work that we do in um, Scots language and in, in, and, and in our own communities. Um, my favorite theorist is a German writer called Theodor Adorno. He had an idea called negative dialectics. He said that whereas Marx proposed dialectics, uh, synthesis, antithesis, sorry, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, Adorno said that's too easy. There is thesis and antithesis, and you have to focus your mind so hard on both of these, these contradictions, so hard that eventually it actually tears, it briefly tears uh, a rip in the fabric of reality. And he says, through that tear, you will briefly glimpse the world as it would be seen in a messianic light. Um, it's a strange sort of Marxism, but I, I think there is something for us in that. If we can embrace properly our strange duality as artists, as a country, um, uh, 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 as a Saltar society and so forth, if we can embrace that duality, we might be able to work hard enough on our internationalism and our nationalism, our local and our uh, distant, to uh, briefly pull apart reality and glimpse the world as it should be, which I think is the task of art. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joyce and David, to startling, stimulating, and in many ways sensational speeches. I'd like to invite Joyce first to respond. Uh, any thoughts she may have arising from listening to, to David? Uh, yes. Um, um, I, th I think what David's saying is incredibly deep about the moment that we find ourselves in now. I think 
having lived in a country which um, um, knew a very high level of consensus during the 1990s and lived through and been involved in the referendum of uh, 1997 where 75% of us voted for, um, voted for the Scottish Parliament um, and um, where Labour and the SNP, usually at daggers drawn and certainly still so today, campaign together for that result. I can't help being very much aware of how disempowering 50-50 splits mm. are in the life of any nation. You can see American politics being almost entirely disempowered by a 50-50 um, split between, or something close to a 50-50 split between Democrats and Republicans. And you can see, I don't know whether there are dark forces behind uh, the emergence of so many 50-50 splits, there might be. But, but you can see how those who don't want politics to be effective and want existing structures of power to remain unchallenged are fond of these splits. Now, Scotland, I think, has ended up with this split, um, in a sense, through no fault of its own. Um, um, it, we've we've um, been involved in a long process of uh, some sort of disentanglement from the, the kind of UK that existed when I was a little girl, um, with its pink bits on the map and, and um, its tremendous sense of self-confidence and its post-war mission um, to create one of the world's first uh, cradle-to-grave welfare states and to really make it work, which was a fine mission and one to which many Scots were fully subscribed, including my parents who were Labour voters all their lives, like so many in Scotland. Um, but we've ended up in this place of 50-50 division simply because that process has reached a kind of, um, for the moment, a kind of stalemate. And um, I just wonder whether David, what he's talking about when he talks about the role of arts in that stalemate um, is, 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 is a more direct approach to it. I mean, one of the things that has slightly puzzled me about covering theatre in Scotland in recent years is that it does cover a lot of quite topical subjects. I mean, things like conspiracy theories and the impact on the human mind, um, various issues to do with Me Too and the sort of changing structure of power between the sexes, um, um, issues to do with um, exclusion, even with um, people, uh, with the gr growing group of people who um, challenge traditional definitions of gender and all the rest of it. So there are lots of contemporary issues in there, uh, not least issues to do with the environment and with the global crises of inequality and of climate change that we all face. But very few people write anything at all about the current 50-50 stalemate in Scotland. And I just wonder whether as a creative person you have any, you know, somebody who mentors other creative people as well as being one yourself, whether you've got any insight into why that is. I haven't seen, I saw one play about the referendum, no two maybe, about the, the night of the, the 2014 referendum. And one was a guy who was depressed because it was a no, and the other one was a very clever one about what would have happened if it had been a complete tie. <laughs> and, and been able to declare a majority for either side. Um, but that's it, two short um, play pie pint plays in all these years. What do you think that's about? Um, well, first of all, I would say, do come to both Pitlochry and the Lyceum <laughs> later this year, where Peter Arnott's play, Group Portrait in a Summer Landscape, <laughs> will be <laughs> attending to some of these issues. I'm only half joking, actually. Peter said during the referendum, I think Pete, someone asked him about why there wasn't uh, art about the referendum, and he said it was all done five years ago, or it's going to be done in five years' time. Yeah. And I think we are now uh, over five years, aren't we? Way we'll, we'll beyond five years. <laughs> anyway, well, we here we. The well, there was a pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, I'll be directing Peter's play, Group Portrait in the Summer Landscape, which I think in some ways will attend to some of those issues. Um, and I also want to thank you, Joyce, for obser for that observation. Um, we didn't know at the beginning of this evening who was going to speak first. I, I, in fact, I thought I was going to speak first. And I feel like if we'd been the other way around, you'd all be buoyant now and sort of zippy and joyful. <laughs> and instead, I've brought the mood down. And I, I hope in a way that's a, 
manifest of the anti-Ziggy itself. I, I'm as much Joyce <laughs> as I am me in this. I, I, Joyce is absolutely right in all the positivities that she radiated. And in fact, I did wonder about just changing the speech entirely after she spoke, because I, I do agree with that. But I just, there's been too much struggle, I think, for those at the cold face of making, certainly Scottish theatre recently, for me to be able to speak at a moment like this and not draw attention to some of the issues. But what I would say is I think Joyce, by talking about the, um, I, I would say Joyce's positivity is really important and true. Um, I would like to create more environments in which that could be discussed, debated, thrown around, you know, where there could be spats in letters pages, mm. should, I don't know what the, Twitter, I suppose, maybe. Mm. But the, 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 there's something about, it mattering, and I do think it matters. Oh, I forgot, I forgot, this is important. There were two moments I wanted to draw attention to, so this can be my response to Joyce. Uh, one was I noticed enormous numbers of women friends of mine going, were going to a concert. It was the Young Fathers in Leith. They're playing at Leith Theatre. And my wife was going, and her friends in the village were going, and then there was friends of mine in Glasgow. And, but there was also extraordinary numbers of young people going. And also the old rock blokes were going. And I've never encountered anything where it brought together actual, proper actual youth, the age of my son, 20 odd. But also, uh, you know, just North Queens Free village people, the village people. Um, but also the old rock blokes all going down to Leith Theatre to see these three lads from Edinburgh make an extraordinary noise. And that's a moment where I thought there's something here, mm. potentially the best band on these islands, comes from Edinburgh and is made up of uh, a, a boy, a, a man who is the, 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 daughter, the son of an asylum seeker and an Edinburgh lad. Uh, and uh, I don't know the backgrounds of them all, but the point being, it seemed to be something incredibly emblematic in that moment. And that struck me as a sort of a future-facing moment. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, the other was that I, we had kidnapped in our theatre and it absolutely sold out. It was terrific. And a very funny show, very, very popular. I think it's a really exciting show. But it was premised on the idea of... Um, uh, it was a, a, a witty and clever take on, on Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. And there was a moment where I thought, the trouble is, most of the people in this audience, they don't, I mean, they've never read Kidnapped, and they've certainly not seen it on the telly, and they've not seen any straight adaptations of Kidnapped. So it, it struck me that we were in an odd situation where it's like we have this hanging culture with somebody like Stevenson, where everybody in this room knows that, which shared by a whole one set of people, but it's completely absent from the lives of a whole other set of people. And I was very, conf I was both heartened by how well it was received and also confused by how it worked as a signifier of Scottish culture. Sorry, but the young fathers, that was the positive. Yep, yep, yep. Shall so we now um, move into our question, answer, response? So you can hear me first. And uh, Rebecca has a microphone, so please wait till she comes to you. Could you hold up your hand if you have any questions, any responses to what you've heard from Joyce and from David across here? Thank you very much. Um, uh, that's terrific. I really enjoyed that. And yet I also want to throw a minor bomb or two into it. Because I think there's something about, let's say, the Saltire Society idea that is a middle class idea. And all I want to, the bomb, the first bomb is, let's remember the community drama movement led by that great Scottish poet, Joe Corey, that a hell of a lot of people don't know it ever existed. Let's remember the great work in the 1950s of Hamish Henderson and uh, Thurzo Berwick and Norman Buchan, who
who blasted it open and, and restarted the folk song movement. And then in the 60s, let's remember the tremendous emergence of Liz Lockhead and Tom Leonard, who blasted open the consensus that English was the language of Scotland or else, uh, or else uh, something that wasn't a language at all. The, Tom Leonard and Liz Lockhead blew the place apart. And I think a lot of what followed uh, went through that door. Um, the, work, the work of um, Chief It and Stagging and Black Black Oil, that's been mentioned, that's terrific. The next thing that happened, which has not been mentioned at all, is the stuff that I and others have been involved in for about 30 or 40 years, and that is the, the community newspaper movement and the writer's workshop movement. Now, most people in this room probably don't know much about either of those, but that was a vital thing that went on throughout the 70s and the 80s. And part of what helped to open the way for that was the work of Bob Tate as editor of Scottish International, Scottish International, not Scotland con con contained inside itself. Scottish International, that was a great moment. And that brought together, paradoxically, Catholics and Protestants for the first time. Because remember, this is the country that actually the Scottish the Presbyterianism voted to send Catholics back to Ireland, you know, only 70 or 80 years ago. How many people knew that? <laughs> that was at the General Assembly in the 30s. Astonishing act. But the work of Scottish International and a lot of what went on in the 70s and 80s broke that. It's not possible any longer to promote hostility to Catholicism in Scotland. It used to be when I was growing up, everybody in Saltcoats and Ayrshire hated Catholics, unless they were Catholics themselves. I'll stop at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Joyce, David, do you have any response? Um, well, there, there are so many great people, that, and I'm, I'm aware of everything that you've um, listed there. Bob Tate, of course, the man who, at a conference, a Scottish international conference in George Square Theatre, hosted the first ever rehearsed reading of the Cheviot, the Stag and the Black Black Oil, in 1973 or two, the beginning of 1973. Dolly will know. She's sitting here, member of the original cast. Um, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so many people to whom so much is owed. Liz Lockhead, certainly by the beginning of the 1970s, uh, emerging as a really distinctive new voice, although she wrote most of her plays in the 1980s. Her poetry was already very influential in the 1970s. And as you said, the whole Noise and Smoky Breath crew, including Tom Leonard, and of course, uh, David briefly referred to his famous um, 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 tag, which he borrowed from someone else, I think, about uh, imagine you were living in the early days of a better nation, but Alistair Gray, who in a way changed everything in terms of what was um, possible in, 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 in Scottish literature and belong to that generation. So there's no limit to the great names that we could mention, but um, perhaps we should return a little bit to the question David just raised, because, you know, we in this room are defined by our interest in these things and our knowledge of these things and the fact that we care enough about them to get to know about them. What about a young person growing up today who's just interested in you know, receiving the same international culture as anyone else from their mobile phone or wherever, um, who if they ever look at the telly in, in the sense of sort of, you know, um, 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 uh, terrestrial telly, it'll be some news reader from London, you know, giving a kind of London perspective on the news. I mean, exactly where and how and how much can we expect our schools to do to introduce um, young people um, um, now to the huge body of Scottish work that exists. I don't think we really can expect it. I mean, apart from anything else, even the mere attempt to achieve any kind of gender balance in what you do um, means that a lot of the traditional canon of literature in any country becomes a, a wee bit problematic because it's so male-dominated. So, you know, um, it's, it's extremely difficult um, to know what to do, really, about, um, about educating people about Scotland. And also, you have to be aware that there is a huge hostility to it. I mean, undoubtedly, the small efforts that have been made to introduce a bit more Scots language and Scots literature into schools in the last 20 years or so since devolution have often been 
you know, um, not welcomed. Um, and people still don't get it. They still think that if kids are learning um, poetry in Scots, it means they're being taught to speak wrong. And so, you know, um, I, 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 I'm not sure how we handle all of that. Uh, all I know from my own experiences is that the best responses to all these conundrums are always the creative ones, you know? It's always that twinkle in the eye of the big yin or that sheer brilliance of a play by David Gregg or uh, the, just the explosion of creativity and, 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 and um, um, a kind of synthesis of aspects of Scottish culture that was there in the TV at the Stag and the Black Black Oil, which, by the way, even I am too, um, I'm too young ever to have, have seen in the flesh. But, of course, I've seen the famous television film of it. Um, and, um, and, you know, all we can do is try to be creative in the face of all of this. We're still here on our bit of rock called Scotland. We're still here speaking in Scottish voices, speaking about our future, debating our future. And we need the creative um, element of that, the artists, the filmmakers, um, and the people who reimagine it for us in the way that David just eloquently described at the end of his lecture. We need them. Um, to, to point the way forward, because as he says, facing the future is absolutely vital. It's easier to face the future if you know your past and know how to respect and love it. But you have to do it anyway, with whatever tools you have, whatever knowledge of your home place that you have. Um, I agree with everything Joyce said. I also think that class I think class might even be the solution. I would, I, first of all, I agree with the, 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 the people you've brought up and I would say, on the one hand, in a positive sense, I can point to a number of interesting working class artists who I do think are breaking apart some of our boundaries. So Darren McGarvey, primarily as a writer of books now, but also as a hip hop artist. There's a number of hip hop and spoken word artists who are doing the same. Uh, stand up, what used to be called stand up poetry, you might call it hip hop or the, the it's a very low barrier to entry and it's actually very few gatekeepers. You don't need a grant to do it. And that's something that's incredibly vibrant in Scotland right now. I, I just want to do another thing though and say, it just really saddens me that there was far more working class presence in Scottish theater 20 or 30 years ago when I was starting out than I see around me now. Uh, actors really, it's just really difficult to make a life in theater unless you already have money or you're very, very lucky. And, you know, we, I'm afraid that the, 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 the big pools that are sending through writers, actors, and so forth are so skewed towards the middle class in a way that it just didn't seem to be the case when I started out. Um, and that's because of stupid things like housing benefit rules and education rules. When I say stupid, I just mean it's nothing, I'm not even really sure how much it's got to do with culture or the, or the Saltire Society. It's, it's about a generalized crushing of the ability to be playful um, amongst young people and uh, to, to, to explore. But I do think class absolutely is vital and has to be part of the solution that we're talking about. There's a gentleman at the back. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. Um, I, I'm thinking about the anti-syzygy. Um, and it brought to mind a friend's just written an essay about the anti-syzygy. It's called Paul McGrathy, a, a poet. Uh, and he, he traces it back. He says the, it's, it's the zigzag of contradiction under the state the stress of foreign influence. In other words, it was always being developed as against an imperial British-English notion, where today we have this strong sense, like you say, of a devolved Scotland, which is its own thing, um, which claims on the one hand to be very liberal, but is part of the instrument drawing resources away here, under which there's this multiplicity you describe. My question and what I'm wondering is what binds those multiplicities together and the missing kind of element that can thread them together when maybe they're operating against this idea of Scotland. And maybe the missing word, it's not entirely missing, you did raise it at the very beginning, Joyce, talking about the STUC's role, and you've just ended there, David, by talking about the, the issue of class. But if you were talking about, I mean, we're talking about race too, look at the makeup of this room, but there's a, a kind of um, question of what it is that brings um, race-based, class-based, 
maybe gender-based, identity-based movements against the establishment in Scotland together in a way that gives them space and energy to thrive and develop. Uh, and not to have Scotland all the time cited as, as, as liberal and progressive, because that frustrates, antagonizes, and alienates. Um, the word that comes to mind for me is left. Um, and, and it's about saying that maybe there was a big left cultural movement or moment. Are we still in the same place where this, a lot of the energy is coming from or needs to come from the left? I'm biased. I edit a magazine called the Scottish Left Review. Um, but it's, it's just about saying, is there not a more explicitly anti-establishment anti movement that needs to be part of this cultural revival that you're describing? Uh, could you just check your mics are on? Is that on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first, Joyce? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I think it's a fascinating question. I think you're probably right. I, I was just thinking, I think we're on the verge of an explosion, and I don't know how it's going to go or what's going to cause it or how it's going to happen, but I just feel, I feel it in the waters that... that there's, there's a going to be something very interesting in Scottish culture happening because it just has to. You can, you know, when it's like a balloon, uh, is it a balloon that's ready to burst or something? It's, that's that's almost too full an image. It's something else. It's people at the end of their tether, <laughs> and and I and I've, I I can give you an example. Just before the autumn, uh, it was the lowest point in the Lyceum's history financially it was really 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 difficult the Liz Trust budget had utterly fucked everything um, I'm not joking that, that it, it was the Scottish government pretty much rang us up and said all the money has drained away because of that preposterous um, month um, we were faced with incred hundred thousand pound increase in our heating bill our audience were not coming back because they were worried about their heating bills, never mind COVID. All the costs had gone up. Everything was just really, really, really difficult. And it looked, I mean, we were months away from insolvency and we were having to seriously talk to our board about, about how we would handle insolvency. Um, and we weren't alone. That, you know, loads and loads of Scottish arts institutions were in the same place. Um, and in that moment, I said to my colleague, Mike Griffiths, do you know what I think we should do is I think we should go bankrupt, keep the keys and then squat the theatre. <laughs> um, because, because that would actually constitute a kind of liberation from... And actually, to be honest, I'm not sure I should be squatting the theatre. I think I should chuck the keys you know, and see who grabs them. But I... I I'm not trying to be flippant. I, I do think something has to kind of blow, and I think it will blow from artists. I think it will, it will be something we don't expect. Um, and I'm sure that class and left politics will, have, will be part of it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know beyond that, but I, I'll just try to keep running the theatre in the meantime. I, I, I think I agree, really. I, 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 I do think that, that most of the energy in Scottish culture does in some sense come from the left and always has. I mean, I don't know why that is, or it's maybe just a general rule that culture, uh, energy and culture comes more from the left than the right, simply because um, it, the left is always about redistributing power from those who currently have it um, to those who don't have enough of it. And that's a kind of energy um, that, that, that shares something um, with the arts, you know, it's challenging what is, it's making people think about it differently, it's saying could we do this differently and better, more fairly, more excitingly, um, could we tell different kinds of stories, um, and if so, what would they look like? So I'm, I'm not sort of squeamish about uh, left-right divisions in politics, I think the left's extremely important in Scotland's history. I myself am a, a, a lifelong trade unionist. Um, the STU, sadly, like so many other public institutions, has been hollowed out a bit in terms of what it can afford um, to do. You know, there was a time when it could afford to have an arts officer and, and, and uh, really two people working on arts projects at any given time. It's not in a position um, to do anything um, like that now. Um, and I think that goes to what David was saying, um, which, is, um, which is that there has been across the UK a kind of really steady, steady hollowing out 
of a lot of the public goods that we take for granted. And that goes everywhere, from the NHS, which in England are being steadily privatised and which in Scotland is, is, is facing many of the same challenges, although the privatisation process is, has been held back um, a little bit. Um, it goes for our public transport, which in many areas is, is simply not as good as it once was in terms of the number of bus services they are since privatisation and stuff like that. It goes to the, the sort of miserable underfunding in all sorts of areas, particularly the areas that we all know and love that belong to local authorities, and that's from social care, where people who care about their jobs as carers and want to give time to, to the people in their care just don't have the time to do it properly anymore because of the pressure um, that they're under, and that is the most miserable thing, to things like libraries and swimming pools and leisure centres and nurseries and all the things that make a community thrive and happy. The funding for all of these things has been under too much pressure for far too long. The penny-pinching in all of these areas of public good has, has, has been outrageous given the amounts of wealth that the already wealthy have accumulated over these years since the 2008 crash. And so I share David's feeling in that sense that the rank injustice of the global um, financial and sort of wealth distribution system that we're now living in will face more radical challenges. I mean, if you look at a city like London, beautiful city, vibrant city, one of the most successful multicultural cities in the world, for sure, but now blighted by acres and acres of its most prominent property, the places where people used to squat in the 1970s when I was a student actually, um, now being owned and guarded and kept as assets by people who maybe spend a couple of weeks in them a year, whole blocks of luxury flats unoccupied, whole streets of pretty houses in Kensington and places like that, largely unoccupied or only occupied on a very occasional basis. This cannot go on when people are homeless and when people need these assets that are being hoarded um, and are being um, treated wrongly. Um, and uh, obviously that, that underfunding of the public sphere and that permission for those who are already wealthy to hoard assets and impoverish the rest of the community um, affects the arts as well. It affects the whole ethos of the arts. It means that there's still plenty of arts for rich people who can afford a 100 quid ticket or a 200 quid ticket or a 300 quid ticket or a £10,000 ticket like the, like the tickets for Beyonce the other night. But there is not, um, there, isn't, there are no, you know, there's, there's relatively little arts left for those who need to have really cheap tickets, all tickets 50p, as the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow used to say in the 1970s. Um, and um, the, 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 this kind of stinginess about the public sphere, what um, Galbraith once called the, the public squalor and private affluence, has so gone beyond affluence, it's private, immense wealth confined to a very few. Um, that will blow, something will happen. You can't have your cities um, you know, denuded of people by the greed of those that want to hold property as an asset. And that's what's happening to some cities across the planet now, including, to some extent, mm -hmm. here in Edinburgh. <laughs> this gentleman and then this lady. Oh, there's Tom. Thank you. Um, I wondered where community theatre uh, sits with what you're talking about. Um, just this last week, I saw a production of community theatre at our mighty festival theatre with 64 people, 80 people on stage, including 34 young people, um, almost selling out on some days, the 2000 seats theatre. Um, in Livingston, the, the Howden Centre is under threat. Mm -hmm. And the big, the big people, uh, group of people who are being campaigning against that are the local amateur, uh, dance and theatre companies, the, 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 the community, the 18 different community theatre companies that came, and, and dance and, and whatever companies that came together to, to, to help it. I think there is a really strong uh, community theatre still um, outside um, the Lyceum, and, and, I, and I love the Lyceum. And I know that you're getting people on their stages, but uh, I, where, does, where does community theatre stand in this? I, I, I want to come in quickly on that. I really agree, Tom. So first of all, I'm going to put in a word for the Lyceum. We, we of course, have uh, well over 300 kids in our youth theatre. We also have our uh, over-60s group. We also have our playwriting group and so on. So we, we 
I, I'm, I'm passionate about getting people on the stages. We did the hour we knew nothing of each other, where we had somewhere in the region of 100 people on stage in that show. But I was researching today when each of the Scottish making theatres began, and I thought it was very interesting to note that Dundee Rep, for example, began as a mixed company of amateur and professional in 1939, I think. I believe the history of the sits, Joyce will know better than I, emerges out of a, a community theatre movement, is that fair to say? Yes, yes, the, the, the Glasgow players and the, and the Jewish um, players in Glasgow um, kept it going during the Second World War yeah. with some fantastic uh, productions. There was a man who was a tailor called Avram Greenbaum um, and, um, who um, was a fantastic director and he used to direct your great European classics with huge community casts and he m managed to continue doing that even during the war. Um, and, um, and at the end of the war, that meant that the Citizens was still a kind of living yeah. theatre, which then became the home of the Citizens Company, With which was, was a professional company, but drew on a mm. lot of actors from those amateur companies. And I think, yeah. I suppose what I would say is, I think that in a very well-intentioned desire to protect the professional aspect of Scottish theatre, which took so long to build up, we... We have to be careful that we're not cutting ourselves off, actually, from something that's an incredible resource, which is the fact that Scottish theatre and culture has always been a, a mix of the amateur and professional in a very positive way, with amateur not meaning anything negative. And if you look at traditional music or you look at um, uh, all kinds of art forms, you'll see people with day jobs mm. who are extraordinary at what they do. Um, but that's why I was partly saying my thing about squatting the Lyceum, that there was a point, this is slightly improved, but there was a point at autumn last year where in order for a show to break even at the Lyceum, if we made the show, uh, it could not have more than three actors. Now, fortunately, relatively swiftly that changed. I think we're back up to about five now. By the way, that's with selling 60% of seats, which isn't, you know, that, that's quite good if we sell 60%. Now, if you think five actors on the Lyceum stage is what that theatre was built for, it's not. It's built for 12, 15 actors. We can't dream of that at the moment. I mean, we really can't. So I do think there's a point at which mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves the question of are we denying ourselves a certain type of culture by, by not finding ways for these two branches to work together better? But I don't know the answer to it, Tom, though, as well, because I know it's fraught with difficulty and I don't want equity yeah. giving me a big... If, if, you, if you go to the Churchill Theatre, you'll regularly see a, a, a cast of, of 10 or 12 mm. uh, performing a play. It might not be fantastic, mm -hmm. it might not be cutting edge, but, you know, mm. you see Liz Lockhead or whatever, um, they're, and, and they're, they're great plays, as you say, they're, they're huge quality. Yeah. We have someone waiting to speak here. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested what you, when you talked openly about how close to the edge the Lyceum was last autumn. And it's not a new story for me. I work in the arts in rural Scotland, predominantly the south of Scotland. And I'm very concerned about the loss of individual talent to the arts mm -hmm. because I know of individual cases. I know of a mid-career composer, female, who's left the profession, retrained as a mental health nurse because she couldn't feed her family. I know of a performance artist who was on the verge of suicide. I, there are other cases. And loss of the talent at this stage in mid-career artists <coughs> is really shocking. And I, I don't want to bring the tone of the conversation down, but this is the reality of the arts in crisis in the area I inhabit in Scotland. And it is the loss of public funding that you and Joyce have both talked so eloquently about that underpins this, because without that, they can't sustain full-time careers. It, it, it's partly that, but I would also draw attention to, it's the loss of the superstructure of society underneath them that isn't to do with arts funding that actually makes the arts funding the last lifeline so that when the arts funding goes you, you're left with nothing if you were living in such an environment where uh, 
where, for example, benefits or tax credits worked in the way that they used to, where there was enough public services nearby that, you, you know, you, you, transport and health and so, you know, so forth were being looked at. I think we sometimes look to arts, to arts funding, to solve problems that are actually, you know, they're, they're really, really deep. And, and the arts funding is just the last, you know, snap of that finger. And I'm sorry to hear those stories. And I'm also very sorry to say it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. And, and I could tell you many, many similar stories of, of people who've stopped working in theatre in many different capacities over this last few years. Yeah. I mean, I, when, I, when I was speaking, I talked about the positive statistics about women um, in the professional theatre, you know, bearing in mind what Tom said about how that's not by any means the whole Scottish theatre scene. But um, um, although the proportion of women working had increased so well and the theatre that people are seeing, um, um, uh, therefore we'd, uh, professional theatre would have a more female um, voice to it, nonetheless, the actual number of women in those posts had declined slightly between 2015 and, and, and 2020 because the number of posts had declined so much. So, you know, half of not very much is less than, than, than a third of a lot. And it, it, the, the number of available um, professional jobs in Scottish theatre that, that was, were contained within this survey had declined by 20% in five years between 2015 and 2020. And that's because of what David's talking about, the fact that uh, institutions can't produce without co-producing and every time there's a co-production that's one less production, one less team, one less cast, um, etc. And that's been going on, as, as David says, for a solid 15 years. It's really been going on since 2008 and it just has to stop. I mean the, the whole uh, financial system on which this kind of impoverishment of the public sphere is predicated um, has to be challenged now, I think because it's not delivering the goods. It's delivering massive wealth to a tiny, uh, a tiny minority. And you know, for sums that these people would never miss, hugely important things like libraries, like theater groups, like, like a decent level of benefits. I mean, this is the th I mean we're, we're living in a country with a benefit system where people are paid benefits on which they cannot live. They cannot live on them. They have to go into debt, and if they face any crisis at all, they just can't, um, can't finance it. So, you know, our benefits are too low, our public uh, sphere is impoverished, our, our public um, institutions and buildings and all the, the institutions that should be there to, to catch people when they fall are, are under increasing threat. The arts is part of that. Um, and um, it, it really does need to be challenged. And the arts is a good place to begin challenging it because as I'm fond of saying to every government minister and MSP and MP and anyone in politics I've ever met, the sums of money involved are not so very large. You can make a big difference for a relatively small outlay of public money. And it's happened in the past and it's been great and it could happen again. I'd like to thank Joyce and David for an amazingly stimulating evening. I'd like to say that the final range of questions and comments remind us that the society, the Salter Society, isn't an arts organization or is deeply interested in the arts. It's a cultural organization. And a cultural organization which is interested in the ways in which elements of culture, including the arts, interact. And we're reminded in that last series of exchanges that the arts are about not just some kind of rather well cast performance on a stage, but about the very nature of our society, the very nature of our culture, and in fact, the very nature of our Scotland. And that brings us back to our topic tonight, which is the future of Scottish culture. I'm very grateful to you for being here. I'm very grateful to our speakers, and I'd like you to please uh, thank them for their excellent contributions.